Hi, and thank you for stopping by our YouTube channel. To follow along with the sermon, download the My Sermon Notes app in the link below. For more sermons like this, go to citygatechurch.us. Enjoy, and God bless you. Guys, I want to talk to you today about a prophecy, uh, several prophecies that are in the Bible. And this is not in your notes, but I want you to have this before we get started. It is estimated that there are 300 prophecies in the Old Testament of the first coming of Christ, and the same in the New Testament for the second coming of Christ. <clears throat> and before I go any further, I have a question that I would like to ask you. How many of you believe that Jesus came? That he was born of a virgin, that he came as he was prophesied to come, that he came? Now, if all those prophecies came true, and we see that the prophecies are laid out, that he is coming again. How many of you believe that he is coming again? But you see, the world doesn't believe that. Today, I want to share some of these with you because I want you to understand some things. If you will pull your notes out in your app, and if you don't, you've got a bulletin there you can write on, write all over the edges and everything you want. We're good to go with it. But six prophecies of the Messiah. Now, I want you to understand, I am not working on doing this strictly from a position of the birth of Christ, but six prophecies of the Messiah and taking the scriptures and tying them together and just showing you what we have to look forward to next week as we prepare for Christmas. The first prophecy is this. The Messiah would be from the lineage of King David, Jeremiah 23 and 5, 600 B.C., now, I'm putting these dates here because I'm going to build a case for you and show you that it would be impossible for somebody to have been able to share this information with another person and another person and another person so that they could just be saying the same thing over again. Jeremiah 23 and 5 says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in all the earth. Now I want to tell you, I had a whole other sermon prepared. I already had it put together and I had already pushed sin. And God spoke to me and said, that's not what I want. That's what you want. So I had to hit the eraser and start all over. So yesterday I wrote two sermons. And if you know how much I struggle to write one, you know, that was God himself. And I want you guys to understand this. I want you to get this and I want you to know this. I was talking with dad. You guys know I spent a lot of time talking with my dad. And he texted me something. And I never realized how much I was like him. And he said, Howie, I refuse to ever pastor an ignorant church. Now, not ignorant. Because we're in the South. That's a whole new connotation right there. But ignorant. Lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, lack of depth. And I have taught you from day one, I have opened this Bible and I have broken down line by line, verse by verse, scripture by scripture, and I have showed you what the word says to the best of my knowledge and the best of my ability. And there's been times that I've said some things and I had to go back and revisit and say, hey, you know what? I missed it right here. But isn't that part of growth for all of us? And we have to be in that position to where we can admit that we make mistakes because we all are human. But when it comes to the word, I want you to be rooted and grounded. I want you to have the knowledge. I want you to have the understanding. And I want you to have the discernment through the Holy Spirit so that when you read the scriptures, that you see and understand and know the truth. Not what the world would have you to know. Not what I would have you to know. But what God, through his word, would have you to know. Amen? The fulfillment of this prophecy is in Luke 3, 23 and 38. And it gives the genealogy of Christ. Now, I'm not going to go through and read all of this. But if you go through and you look at Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38, you will find a complete genealogy of Jesus from his birth all the way back to Adam and then God as creator. You will see that. In that line, you will find David. In that line, you will find Jesus. 
and you will see how the fulfillment of it took place. And that was for BC. The next prophecy is the Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Now we knew that we know that this happened in the New Testament when Christ was betrayed by Judas, but Zechariah prophesied this in 487 BC, 487 years before Christ, Zechariah said these words. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the pot that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw to them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Now let me explain what the potter is here. The potter is what is called the potter's field. The 30 pieces of silver that Jesus was sold for by Judas was given back to the priest because he refused to take it. He didn't want to take it before he went out and took his life. He put that down and he said, I refuse to take it. But the deal had already been struck. <clears throat> so when he got his money, he didn't want the money. He refused to take the money. When that happened, the priest couldn't take the money back because it came from the money of the temple. He couldn't take it back. He couldn't touch it. So they took that money and they bought a field called the potter's field where the indigent people that had nothing could be buried. So they would have a place. The fulfillment, Matthew 26, 15. This is the words that were said. And he said, what are you willing to give if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. This is 30 AD. This is just very shortly prior to the death of Christ. So we see 487 to 30 AD. We see how many years this is that a prophecy was given and the prophecy was fulfilled. The next prophecy is the Messiah would have his hands and feet pierced. Psalms 22, 16. This is 1,000 BC, a thousand years before Christ. David penned this psalm in 22, 16, and it says this. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now this is not David talking about himself. This is a prophecy that he is making about what is going to happen. Now I want you to look at this. The dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked. These were the people that were supposed to be the righteous people. They're now considered dogs and wicked when David pens this. Look further at the fulfillment in Luke 23 and 33. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. The Bible goes on further and it talks about how that he was nailed to the cross. Later on, we see Thomas doubting that it was actually him. And he walks up to Thomas and he said, Thomas, put your hand in my side. Because Thomas said, if I put my hand in his side and I put my finger in the holes in his hands, I won't believe it. And Jesus walked up to him and said, here, Thomas, put your hand here. Here, put your hand here. It is me. And Thomas repented and said, my Lord and my God. You see, some people have to see some things. Some people can't believe it and take it by faith. And God knew that. He chose Thomas the same way he chose Judas. The same way he, poured, he, he chose Peter. He knew what he was getting. He knew how we were. He knew how our minds were. And he chose every one of them by hand. And when he says in Isaiah, this is a, a sublet. In Isaiah, he says, I have engraved you in the palms of my hands. Who can take you from me? Who can pluck you from my hand? Who can take you out of my hand? Jesus holds us that have been bought by the blood that he shed on Calvary. Jesus holds us in the palm of his hand. Amen. Who can take us from that hand? Prophecy. People would cast lots 
for the Messiah's clothes. Psalm 22, 18. Again, David writing a thousand years prior to this happening. Psalm 22, 18 says, They divided my garment among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. The fulfillment of this is in John 19, 23, and 24. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from top, from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. 30 A.D. What do they mean when they say cast lots? Good question, Cam. In the Bible, when it talks about casting lots, it's the same way we would do what is called casting dice. Or we throw a dice, or we cast a die. And so they would have numbers, they would each pick a number, and then they would roll the dice, and then the lot would fall that way. So when they do that, that's one way of doing it. And the other is a thing that we call drawing straws, the short straw. So there's a couple of different ways of doing it. But that's what it was referring to here. Okay? Good question, Ken. Thanks for asking. So I want to share something with you that is so important that we miss so much. And I'm going to back up. And I want you to see something. If I back up the right way. Okay. Watch this. In the bottom part of this scripture, it says, Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. The tunic was the outer garment that Jesus wore. It was kind of like a coat, if you will, like a big robe. Now, we have one evidence in the scripture of another thing in the Bible that was woven from within and without, and that was without seam. And I want you to know what that was. It was the veil that stood between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. And I want you to understand that when Jesus wore that robe, it was not by coincidence that it was made the way that it was made. Because he was the thing that was separated. And when he died, that was taken from him. That veil was torn from the Bible says from the top to the bottom. It is said that two teams of oxen could not tear it apart. It is said that a sword could not pierce it because it was so thick and so heavy. It weighed tons. It took many, many priests to set it in place because it could not touch the ground. So when the veil was torn from the top to bottom and Jesus cried out and said to tell us die, it is finished. It was done. It was torn. And the holy place and the holy of holies were no longer segregated. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, we have the ability to walk into the presence of God into the holy of holies and literally climb up on the mercy seat, which is the lap of God. Now guys, if you don't get it, I'm trying to let you know, none of this is by accident. It is all by design. Amen? Let's keep going. I'm feeling my preacher come on if y'all ain't figured that out yet. <laughs> the next prophecy is the Messiah would appear riding a donkey. Zechariah 9, 9. Again, 500 years prior. 500 years, the Messiah would appear riding on a donkey. The fulfillment came in 30 AD, Matthew 21 and 7. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and sat him on them. Now, you understand, they brought the colt, they brought the mother, and they brought the colt, but Jesus rode the colt, whereon never a man had sat. And that was part of the fulfillment of the prophecy. Now, what is important about that is because that's a lowly estate. You see, when the people of Israel were looking for their Messiah, they were looking for the one who comes on the white horse. They were looking for a great warrior. They were looking for someone who was going to overthrow Rome and remove their oppressors. They didn't understand when Jesus came the way he did that he had to do what he did 
so that when he returns the second time, he will be on the white horse. The Bible says that righteousness is written upon his right thigh, and in his right hand is a sword. He came as a lamb. He will return as a lion. Amen. The next prophecy is a messenger would be sent to herald the Messiah. Malachi 3 and 1. Now, understand, Malachi, 500 years before Matthew. Everybody get that? Now watch this. Malachi 3 1 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now watch this. The fulfillment came in 27 AD. John 1 26. John answered them saying, I baptize you with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. Now let me explain who that one among you is. Jesus was standing there. This is right before Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. You need to understand the power that is going on right here. I'm going to preach something else if I don't stop. These eight prophecies about the Messiah were written by men from different times and places between 500 and a thousand years before Jesus was born. Thus, there was no opportunity for collusion among them. Notice, too, the specificity. Now, what do I mean by that word specificity? Specifically, notice how accurate every prophecy and fulfillment was. And this is just some, remember? There's over 300. I'm just looking at a few, just eight. Bible scholars tell us that nearly 300 references to 61 specific prophecies of the Messiah were fulfilled by Jesus. The odds against one person fulfilling that many prophecies would be beyond all mathematical possibility. But you know, anytime we tell somebody it's impossible to do something, the one thing we are going to always make sure is we're going to put it to the test. Somebody will, right? Because if you say it's impossible, not happening, not going to do it, can't do it, nobody can do it, it's impossible, somebody's going to attempt. So watch this attempt. It could never happen no matter how much time was allotted. One mathematician's estimate of those impossible odds is one chance in a trillion, 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 trillion. Now let's look at it another way. One in 13 trillion, if it were possible. That's the odds. That's the chance. You could probably win the lottery like 100 times. Just put that out there. If it were possible. That's his attempt. 13 trillion. Now listen. At the time of the birth of of Jesus, the population of the world was estimated at 500 million. Only 50 people were recorded to have known that he would be born. That is not to count King Herod when the three men appeared to him and talked to him. King Herod and his men who tried to kill the baby Jesus. Now I just want you to understand something. There were 500 million people and only 50 people were aware. Guys, we need to understand how important it is for us to get the message, listen to me, of the second coming out. Because every person who raised their hand and believed that Jesus is coming a second time has a responsibility to share that information, to tell somebody that Jesus is coming again. That he was here. I got a, an email this morning. And it disturbed me. Because it said. 
that the alarming rate of the millennials who are leaving church and not returning is due to this fact that their parents did not take the time to teach their children about religion. Didn't take the time to take their children to church. And so instead of the odds being they walked away from it and they wind up coming back later in life, because there has not been there, because for the first time in history, 40, 50 years ago, the majority of the people who were getting married, let's go 50 years ago, were believers. They were Christians. They were both believers, both sides. Maybe one didn't go. And I have this story that I share about my grandfather. My grandfather was an absolute heathen. And that's putting it mildly. I tell everybody I'm a real hillbilly. One of my legs is shorter than the other. My grandfather did time in prison for making moonshine. He was 76 years old when he finally accepted Christ. I got on Google Earth the other day and I just found where my grandparents used to live where the house was. It's gone now and there's a trailer sitting there. But the bridge is still there and the creek is still there where my grandfather had him to go out and chop the ice in the middle of winter in Eastern Kentucky in the Appalachian Mountains because he said, I waited 76 years for this day. I'll not wait another minute. And he chopped through the ice. He had it chopped through and the preacher had to baptize him. He said, could you not wait for spring? He said, no. I'm telling you this because something happened that changed him and he started telling everybody about Jesus. And when it started coming from him, it was a big difference because his testimony to that point had not been one of a godly man. But he asked, my dad asked him one time, he said, dad, because my grandmother in their, all their eyes was one of those religious fanatics. They called them holy rollers back then. He said, Dad, is there such a thing as a God? He said, of course there's a God. And if you ever say that to me again, I'll beat you to death. Now this is coming from a heathen. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Even people who didn't go to church, they still believed that there was a God. Fast forward in his lifetime. And what is being raised by us, us as the people of the United States, us as part of the populace of the world. What are we doing by saying it's not convenient for us to go to church or I don't want to get up or I don't want to go. I don't feel like it. What are we doing to the next generation? Because we don't feel like doing something. We are putting ourselves in a place that we remove the other person's ability to choose. And that's where the harshness comes in. And that's the reality of where we are coming to. You see, in the 60s, there was a couple of movements to remove God from everything. And they couldn't do it by trying to stamp out Christianity, by burning Bibles and all those things. They tried it for years and years, and they couldn't do it. This nation was founded on God. And if you read a book called The Light and the Glory... And if you haven't got a copy of it, you need to get it because it is the true history of how this nation was truly founded. It was in all of the major schools of the day. Every major Ivy League school was a Christian school. Princeton, Harvard, Yale, all of them were Christian schools. Go now to them and see what you get. I'm telling you this because... We need to know the truth. I refuse to pastor an ignorant church. I'm going to tell you what I know. I'm going to give you what God gives me. And I know that God had me to change this sermon for this reason and this purpose. It is time that we wake up and understand how important church is. It's not a box to check off. It is a relationship with Almighty God. That Jesus came as a child... Born, raised, preached, lived, and died so that that veil could be torn so that we could live forever with him, eternal. Amen. Now, this is the truth. I'm going to ask Becky to come up here and do something for me. I can tell she 
Travis brought her home. Kind of like a puppy, huh? (laughs) (laughs) 
brought a puppy too. But I remember the day that I saw Melissa for the first time. And I knew there was something very special about her. And when Travis brought her to Tennessee for the first time, I knew there was something special about her. I'm convinced that she's special. I thank God for you. I am so proud of your accomplishments. I want you to know. This song, Where Feet May Fail. How many times have you failed? How many times Melissa, taking those tests and wondering if you were going to make it or not. Graduated with a three, four, five. Is that close? Fantastic. How many times have you been put to the test? Some of us have been tested. Some of us have not been tested. Some of us have refused the test. But when God tests us, you need to understand that there's always two choices. And it will always be one of two things. If you pass the test, it's to deliverance. If you fail the test, it's to destruction. But what you need to know is, God always makes a way of escape if you fail. He always makes a way for you to take the test again. You see, what Satan does is like the friend of Katie's that failed the test without an opportunity to take the test again. Put herself in a situation unintentionally. How many times do we put ourselves in situations unintentionally? Not meaning to. But yet we wind up being stuck in that proverbial between the rock and a hard place. How many times have we turned our backs on God? How many times have we walked away? How many times have we felt that we were better than we actually were? How many times over and over and over have we done this? Only to find the open arms of Jesus. Every time we turn and come back into his presence. Every time. And if we will but humble ourselves. You see, there's an old saying that says, pride cometh before a fall. The Bible also says that a man shouldn't think more highly of himself than he ought to. This is one of those times that I want you to consider what is being said here today. How many prophecies have we looked at today? Just eight of potentially 300, more or less. And every one of those prophecies came true. And I tell you, as sure as those prophecies came true in the Old Testament, that the prophecies of the New Testament will come true. Because every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We have an opportunity today to get right what is in our own minds and in our own hearts askew, amiss. We have the ability today, right now, to let God be glorified, seen, known, and God. If you're in this room and, and you don't know God right now, this is the perfect time for you. If you're in this room and you just want to reignite your relationship with him, this is the perfect time for you. 
If you're on the internet and you're watching this video, it's the perfect time for you. I want you to know that I love you. There's nothing you can do about that. I love you. But that God loves you so much more than I could ever try to love you. So much more. Thank you. Father, I just want to take the time to glorify your name, to praise you today, Jesus. Thanking you, Lord, for everything you are and for everything that you've done. Lord, the words that you've given me, I have delivered today. And your word declares that your word does not come back void. And I know the words that I have spoken today will for the benefit of those that are here and those that will listen in the future. But Lord, that the truth was told and your word declared. If there's someone here that doesn't know you, Father, I pray that they would ask you into their hearts right now and ask for forgiveness. I know you, God. You've forgiven me so many times. And you'll forgive them and welcome them home. Maybe for the very first time. And all they have to say is, I'm sorry. Forgive me, help me, cleanse me, teach me. And you will allow your Holy Spirit through your blood to do all those things. Bless us today, Father. Keep us close to you. All the requests that have been made known, those that are in our minds and our hearts, those that we even forgot to speak when we thought later. You hear and see all of them, Lord. We pray that you intercede on behalf of each and every one. Bless them, keep them, nurture them, Father. Father, I pray that you would allow your Holy Spirit to soften what is hard, to mend what is broken, and to heal what is wounded. And I ask you these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for being here.